Thank you, Seth Bernard. Good morning. Saturday morning in the bee yard. Getting to be a habit. Beautiful summer morning. Little music. Start the day. Uh, today we have an especially rich uh, set of possibilities here. Seth uh, is having a CD release uh, today, and so he's going to come back and play one or two tunes for us. And we have a special other musician here, Audra Kubat from Detroit, that's going to play. And we also have um, a beginning beekeeper from the Traverse City area who lives up on the Mission Peninsula and uh, is starting realizing a two-year uh, desire to get some bees. So she has some bees this spring, and uh, we were thinking it would be a good way to um, have some small instruction in beekeeping with uh, someone who has had a lot of questions to ask. So with that, Carly, I wonder if you would like to come over and join us. So it'd be nice to get to know you a little bit and the people that are viewing this. I know you have you have two children, right? Yeah, I and have two little girls. Two little girls, mm -hmm. and you um, teach school. You teach middle school in English, is it? Yep, I teach uh, sixth and seventh grade at Old Mission Peninsula School. Yeah. So um, maybe you could tell us a little about yourself. Yeah. So you would like to. I uh, went to school in Leelanau County. Uh, that's where I grew up in Glen Arbor, and um, my dad actually used to keep bees. I don't know if we've talked about this, but my uh, dad kept bees when I was little. Um, so some of my favorite memories are eating honeycomb um, that he had just harvested, and I just loved it. So it's always been a really fond childhood memory for me. Um, but I went to school at Glen Lake, I went to MSU, and then I came up here. My husband and I moved from East Lansing about almost five years ago. We were married about five years. And then we moved up right after my daughter was born, which was a lot of fun, <laughs> moving when she was about two weeks old. So we moved up to Old Mission Peninsula. We live about two miles south of Jolly Pumpkin. And um, I just had a six month old. And so we're, we're pretty busy and we've been pretty busy through the pandemic, um, just trying to get everything in order. And I've been over here a couple of times working with you. And we went to go get our bees from the bee yard, um, what, a month and a half ago? About? about yeah, not much more. Yeah, yeah a, month a month anyway. Ago. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm pretty new at this, I guess. So uh, what what has caused you to have an interest in this other? Well, you mentioned you you love honey, but yes. Um. Well, so I like I said, my uh, I have some fond childhood memories of um, eating honeycomb and just loving honey. But I kind of wanted to make mead initially, and I just always loved it. So I thought I would get interested in it. But the more I read about bees, the more I have really um, just been so fascinated by how they work and um, how they do what they do, how busy they are. I love the fact that it's a whole colony of females. <laughs> you know, I love everything about that. I do too. <laughs> yeah, and they just work their little, you know, their little hearts out. And I just think um, that sometimes really beautiful, intricate things like that really show us the glory of God. And that's why I have really decided to get into beekeeping. Well. We crossed paths up at the small farm conference yeah. about two years ago, right? Yes, and, we did. I was there for my, uh, my dad has a composting business. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I was there for that, and um, I was trying to get interested and trying to actually find, oh, trying to actually find a mentor. And so I, you were a honey keeper, and you were so kind, and we started chatting, and um Susie was there and we talked to her a little bit and I just sat down and I think I even had lunch with you um, You shared your food with me and um, I just really felt really welcome and you were interested in helping me and you were actually the first uh, Beekeeper I'd really spoken to that was interested in helping me too Which I really love and that was so kind of you and so we uh, we met and I came over we tapped Maple trees on your property that winter yeah. and I did it with my I think she was 18 months at the time my 18 months on my back and that was yeah, that was fun. We had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> You're amazing. <So. laughs> we had, I didn't do it for too long. <laughs> long enough. But yeah, so um, and then we kind of I just have kept bothering you and kept bothering you and I'm still here. So. Well, I'm glad you are. Seems like uh, we're off to a good friendship. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it is. It it is uh, satisfying to 
to be able to help someone who's sincerely interested. There's a lot of would-be beekeepers, a lot of people who think of it as a notion that they want to do, but when it comes right down to it, mingling with stinging insects with a cage over your head is not always fun. Oh yeah, and I say a prayer every time I go out. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't get stung to death today. Yeah, and it's, um, I mean, uh, there's a lot of hard things about it, but it is, it perhaps is one of the most rewarding occupations there is, and it's a character uh, developing occupation. I mean, like if you, if you're, if you're inconsiderate of the bees, they figure that out and they'll sting you. If you're too considerate of them and you try to put a hive back together without even killing one bee, it, things are going to fall apart on you because there's a, a sense of timing with it all and, and listening to the bees and how they're, they're uh, responding to the intrusion. I mean, when a beekeeper goes in, it's a horrible intrusion. I mean, you go in there, you start lifting the walls out of their house, and it's surprising they don't destroy you um, because of that. But we use smoke, which uh, will be the, the first thing we'll discuss today, is how to uh, light a smoker and how to use a smoker because uh, for thousands of years, humans have learned that smoke tends to calm bees and it's not so much calm them but distract them from the fact that there's an intruder in their, their living space and so th there's a greater danger than that and that is a fire of their whole life burning up in, in a fire so they consequently that's the overruling message that goes in there so when you start drifting smoke in there the whole hive the bees start loading up their honey stomachs with honey as if they're going to have to abscond, as in leave the whole hive, because they're going to be, they may be burned up if they stay there. So, but using smoke, um, it, it's sort of like discipline in a classroom. If you use, if it's too hard, you drive the kids in, uh, away, and if it's too easy, they drive you away. So, so finding that balance of how to catch how to catch the upsetness just at the right time with a diver and the smoke is a diversionary tactic basically you know you, know, you learn that raising children yeah. it's time for bed well, i don't want to go but just remember what we're going to do before bed oh yeah you know so that right. you get better and better at that as a, as a parent and i'm still working on that part. you're still working yeah <laughs> yeah so anyway they used to the old timers would say a, a, a person who can make a thousand dollars Keeping bees can make about fifteen hundred dollars doing just about anything else. <laughs> so, yeah. so there is truth that requires so much timing and and, and a watchfulness of, of the bees to make it work. So, and it's much harder now with the diseases and uh, and parasites of bees. Is this hard? It's hard to look into that sun, isn't it? Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Oh, All right. Okay. Well, we're not going to be here too much longer. All right. So first thing we're going to do is. Here's the smoker. The smoker is basically a canister with a bellows hooked to the bottom of it and a burning chamber inside with a grate in there. And when you press on these bellows, you introduce air in the bottom. And so you've got um, a container to maintain a fire at a low level. And then when you want it to burn hotter and generate smoke, you press the bellows. But lighting one, as simple as it may seem, is, um, not that simple. is not can be not that simple and it happens over and over again if they're not lit really carefully you wind up with a colony of bees apart and your smoker goes out and that is not good especially with a really big colony of bees because you're constantly trying to um, suppress their tendency to be aware that you're in, in there they don't know that you're not going to hurt them so you have to keep Lighting a smoker starts with matches and little scraps of paper that you could tear out. There, you could tear a few out if you'd like. About an inch wide or so. Okay. Oh, so there's actually a... There's a stain there. Well, you have it. So, you... so we got a couple torn here already. I just rolled them up into little balls before. 
And guys, just a little feedback from the crowd. If you can raise your voices and project a bit. This is about as close as I can get the camera to keep oh, you both in the frame. So we got a piece burning and we drop it in there and we got to be ready with other ones right away to drop them in there or that first one will go out and then you give it a very small smoking and you keep throwing them in there. This is not the way I usually start my smoker. Okay. <laughs> have them red, mostly ready when you start. And that, because one thing you're trying to create is some heat in the canister which gives it a natural draft. Now it's starting to smoke pretty well. So if you very gently tuck these down, if you push too hard, you push the fire out. So you tuck them in there and watch the fire. Previously, I just packed everything really tightly in the bottom. Oh yeah, and then. And then and it will seem fine for a while because there's some residual smoke in there. Now here's going and look see the flames coming up out of there. So we're getting there. So I think we should put a little more in there then. Next time I'll be ready. Okay. You were in the teacher's lounge. I know. <laughs> Drinking my coffee. I was actually. That's exactly. <laughs> So now, that, they get the uh, bag behind it. Behind it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, there are several really nice um, fuels, but one of the, my favorites is our pine needles, not off the tree, but the ones that have um, dropped onto the ground when they shed their needles and try to get them on a, on a, on a dry day um, so they're not all wet. So I put some in there loosely now, I'm letting them heat up. More? Yeah, we'll need more. Yep. I can hear them starting to sound like they're uh, they're burning. Well, okay, this is hot on the edge. Try not to burn myself. Okay. All right, more. Oh, got it. They're cheap. Yeah. I love that part. Might be the only thing I'd be keeping that's cheap. <laughs> All right, some more. Oh, sure. That way. I'm ready. This I'm is packing. so not no. how I start my smoke. No. When it goes out. <laughs> and then what happens to you? It then? goes out in the middle of, and I always start with my weaker one first, so I always have my smoker for my weaker one. And then I get into my busy one, and they're about ready to sting me to death because my smoker has gone. Out. <laughs> All right. So well, there we go. I think we, now we pack them down a little bit, and it, it's a matter of judgment. Too tight, you put on the fire, because you got a little chamber of fire in the bottom there, and if you crush it down, right, it breaks it out. Yeah. Okay. So now, now there's a nice smoker, and if it's lit properly at all, even when it's not being used, it'll maintain smoke like that. Way better. Thank you. <laughs> Give it a puff. Take a puff. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is great. Yeah, that's way better. Okay. Way better. Okay. So another um, useful tool um, with keeping bees is having a spray bottle. And in it, there's uh, a syrup solution that contains um, some herbs that bees seem to really appreciate. And there's essential oils in here, and I'm going to read what they are. Spearmint oil, lemongrass oil, and lecithin, and sugar. And so you go into a hive with this little sprayer. Uh, let's see if it's gonna spray. Can you hold that bottle up? Yeah, wait till I see if it's spraying. Okay. Let me the, spray it. That stuff? Oh, oh the yeah. Honey Be Healthy, this stuff is called. And it seems to be useful. It, it's distracting the bees without using smoke. And they like it. They go, they set to work cleaning it up in there right off, right away, and, um, it smells really nice, too. And it smells nice, yeah, you don't, <laughs> it smells better than some of the things. Get a little aromatherapy with those essential yeah. oils. And, and I think, 
I think they remember that, so it's not only going to be this disruption when you enter their hive, that something nice happened too, you know, you got a dish of ice cream when you were done or something. You know? Yeah. So here we have that in the smoker. I really like to talk to the bees when I get in the hive too. Yeah. I, see, I don't know if it like calms them, but it at least calms me. I tell them what I'm doing and tell them where I'm going to go and how long it's going to take. Yeah. All right. So do you want to get your sure. outfit on? This bee veil. This is, nice. We're gonna. I, I I don't know if I should say, but we're gonna probably have a bee veil fashion show in one of our last uh, episodes. So I'll have to bring mine. What? I'll have to bring mine for my bee veil oh, yeah, fashion the, show. Oh yeah, this is a, this is the one that I like. All right. So now you gotta go. Yeah, but V bale to keep bees from climbing. It has a it has a uh, elastic on it that holds it tight, um, so most of the time bees can't get up there. It's got oh, we have the goatskin glove, mm -hmm. very chic. Thank you, very nice. And they're still white. -ish. And it's still white. Well, this is a beginning beekeeper. Look at the gloves. <laughs> <laughs> In the white, tall. They're not, I know. I still look white. There's barely a smudge on it. Only only the. The drop on top of the hat yeah. there that looks like mouse urine, but is it's not. It's not, thankfully. Yeah. He smelled it earlier. <laughs> so, guys, just gently checking in. Yeah. Since we can't get a mic to work, mm -hmm. um, people in the crowd are really having trouble hearing. So, oh, if you yeah. can really raise your voices up and, and project. Well, we will try. We are. You're going to have to follow us over there. Absolutely. You... Are you ready? I. We're ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Mostly just Bob wanted to kick it out. Pick it out into the back rows, Bob. Your voice. Oh, my voice. <laughs> oh, I'm doing okay? That's the first thing. Yes. Voice. I'm using my teaching voice. Yes. Oh. Use your use your outdoor voices, your folks. Your authoritarian parent voice. Yes. Well, that's a different tone. <laughs> so, you got, you're in charge of the carrying the things. Yeah. Okay. You got the honey, be healthy, and the smoker. Yeah. Let's go to the second high boil. Okay. On your way over there, the second one right here. Um, give them a little smoke, gentle smoking in the end. I don't know if you can hear that, a gentle smoking in, in the top and in the bottom. And in any entrance they have, they've got entrances in the handholds there. Give it a little more of a puff. There, that's it. Nice. Okay. Now one more up on top on the inner cover. So what I really notice when I smoke them is they like change their their tone. Yeah, they do. Well, they, yeah, they're dealing with an issue then, so they communicate that. Um, let's see. I would like to have you put that down on there and then go get me a, a chair or a stool. You want to the side, Bob? I think to the side because it's so slow there. Sometimes I tip over. So when I go into a hive, should I be coming at the hive um, from the side? Whatever is comfortable. Um, and actually, it's nicer, easier to lift combs out from the side. Okay. So here we have a brick on top of this hive, which is used as an indicator of what's going on inside of the hive. So this brick laying flat and towards the back is indicative of a colony for me this is my language that is a queen right in other words had a laying queen in there last time and it also is not too powerful yet and in here is a queen cage these are little cages that queens are you can buy queens through the mail and that this is can you hold letting that up me a... know there should be a new queen operating in here awesome so do you have all like your Brick language written down anywhere, or is it just a practice thing? It's just a practice. I could tell it to you. So, okay, you got that smoker. Okay. Smoke them again gently, top and bottom, and then get some in that little, especially on top. No, I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna pull the cover off the roof, basically the outer cover. And in here, I have in 
insulation for winter, but I found out it seems to be all right to leave it on for the summer too, so I do sometimes, but it's out it's somewhat in the way. Okay, so now this is the inner cover in here. Got to get the edge of that hive tool in there really gently. Bees stick everything down with um, propolis or bee glue that they make from buds of trees. Okay, ready with the smoker now? Let me get it on the side where I'm going to lift it right here. So one time you told me that I'm not trying to subdue them with the smoke, I'm just trying to communicate. Yeah, you're trying to give them a different story to be working on. Okay. Okay. So spray. Which one? Well, um, both and then smoke them slightly. So now I always enter a brood nest. This is where they'll be developing baby bees in here. And when I always enter the brood nest from the side because in because the queen will almost all have confined her laying to these five combs in the center here. And so I have much less chance of hurting her when I lift these out. So this the the queens almost never lay on the outside of the brood nest and typically that's where honey is stored. So I am going to Loosen this frame like so on both sides. Oh, uh, yeah, you lift it out. You need a smoker while you do that. Sure. And this is an uh, important tool, a hive tool. It's just a little. Well, you know, Can you, you hold that up in the camera frame? Part. Here. Just right down here. It's a little pry bar, really. So this one? Yep, do it. No, no, grab it. It's loose already. So oh. take, get it right in the center with both hands. It's that till you get more practice. And then gently, easy. Oh, it's heavy. Just very gently, whoop, slow as you could possibly can. And pull it out. So if it's heavy, that means there's honey There's in a lot of honey in it then. Okay. Oh, it's full of honey. See it in there? Am I holding it at the right angle? Um, if you can actually turn it that way, like. Wow, look at that. So when it's capped like this, that means it's full of yes, honey. Yes, it is. See the, okay. they seal it. These are like tiny canning jars. Do they cap the brood? caps here? Yeah, uh, they do. So there's a mixture every once in a while. There's some pollen in here too. See these yellow colored? Oh yeah. Remember, it's the geometry of this. This is the hexagon, which is the strongest known geometrical form that uses the least amount of um, wax to build. So, all right, so now we'll stand this up here. So whenever you take these frames out, make really sure you, you um, stand them up so somewhere where they, you can depend on them staying there. You see how this is getting a whitish cast to it here? Yeah. Can you see that? The camera lady? Camera girl. Mm -hmm. that, that, that means bees Taste. are bringing in ne flower nectar now, and uh, there's a, a mild honey flow on. The, the uh, Dutch clover is in bloom, and raspberries are coming in now. Notice how quiet the bees are. See all their little heads stuck up there? I mean, we just took a wall out of their home, and I mean, they... They're pretty good, yeah. yeah. They're so behaved. Yeah. <laughs> it's not because they're trained, because they're, they're wild. I'm just going to move slow with the camera here. Okay, let me... Uh, so, as we're showing things to the camera, guys, just one thing to keep in mind is to move very oh, slowly. Okay. Sure. I'm going to get another comb out, so that would be more interesting than that, even... So, yeah. Did you talk about the oxalic acid at all? I did not. That I will. That's maybe more than we want to cover today. But. Good thing you know Yeah. I know I didn't know what that was until you showed me. Just a second. I will give it to you. 
We've got more tiny canning jars on here. Yeah. Brad kicked like that comment, Bob. Oh, more little canning jars. And if you can just hold that nice and still for a moment. Okay, see, there's a lot more pollen in this one. The pollen is the colored dry looking material in the bottom. Oh yeah. Go ahead, you take sure. Okay, so now we have a brood comb. A brood comb is one where uh, baby bees are being raised. And you can see them there. You see every, both of you. Well, what's the difference? Well. Those are browner and Yeah, raised? look, they're raised. Okay. They're brown, and if you look next to them, there are those little grubs that oh, haven't yes. been sealed up yet. And I don't see those in this one. No, because their their brood nest is in the main center five combs a lot of the time. So, so and this if this colony were stronger, they might they would have been out on this frame too. Okay. So should we see the laying queen in here somewhere then? Well, we might. Uh, we weren't. We won't stay in here that long. If we happen to see her, we will. But it, 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 if you look, the age of these larvae is changing. It's probably uh, only eggs out here, and as it gets older, it gets bigger, and when it gets almost to the top of the cells, then they seal them up, and then they're in there for two weeks uh, until they hatch. So an egg laid today would would come out, and the, the young bee would come out in July. That's a pretty long time, actually. It, it is, but it's, I think it relates to the moon cycle. So when we put these back, do we need to make sure to put I, I, yeah, I tried to. Okay. Yep. So here's something you'll run into and you'll wonder what that is. Ooh, it's a queen. It's a, well, it's not quite yet. It's, well, here's. This big raised. Oh, there is. This is a, an emergency queen cell. What but, do you mean by emergency? Well, oh no, it's not, there's nothing in it. Okay. Then, so then we would call these incipient cell cups. And I'm if just you're gonna... not familiar with the word incipient, it means something that might apparently will happen, might happen. So they often make these in case their queen fails and they, they uh, will, I don't know if they transfer an egg or they get her to lay in there beforehand, but they could, they could raise a queen kind of quickly. If they lose their queen, it's all over for them. Even a colony of 50,000 bees can't survive if, they're, if they lose their... Here's, oh, here's a drone. And they... Oh, and hold that nice and still. Cannot, they can't sting. They don't have stingers. All they do is mate. Is he just more black on the bottom? Well, he's fatter. See his, his uh, tail segment? His yeah. abdominal segment, how much bigger it is? Huh. They're quite a bit bigger. And they make a lot of buzzing. He's just been subjected <laughs> to considerable indignity. You showed my butt to the world. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, little drone. Only 56 people were watching at that time. <laughs> so. So, um, you, they, they would not go a whole month without a queen, obviously. Uh, if they lost one and they were able to start an emergency cell, it would be almost a month that they went along without mm -hmm. one. And they won't swarm during that time? No, or? well they can't they, if they don't, well, they that, need the queen th to there's swarm. Two, that's too complex a question. I'll have to Sorry. talk to you later about it. The short answer is no. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. How's our time? Who has a sense of time? It's uh, about 25 to or okay, going to 20. Let's put them back now. We have about 10 minutes then? because yeah, we've got to have time for 15 minutes. minutes. And then we'll do this another day too. And learn a little bit more. So when I put the comb back, should I be worried about really trying not to mess up their comb? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have the utmost caution. There. So these little towels contain a natural acid called oxalic acid that the bees that helps the bees with a terrible parasite called the 
varroa mite. And they, um, and that's a whole other story. I don't want to cover it today, but we'll get this is the same acid that you taste in spinach. And all green plants have it in. It's a natural acid. And it doesn't bother the bees, but it seems to be hard on these mites. And in its concentrated form, if you touch it, you might want to rinse your hands yeah, after? Yeah, because it, it's an acid, so you treat it like an acid. Okay, so you can finish putting this back together. And oh, come here and look for a second. Look how the bees are piling in because or Carly was standing in their flight lane and see the pollen coming in on their legs. Well, now they went in, but there were like hundreds and hundreds of them. So if this was my colony, yeah. I would see how busy that box looked and want to put another box on the top. Yeah. Would that be accurate? It would. And the other thing is the whitening of the combs. You know, when you see the cones getting white at the top, you're starting to realize that they're... All right, bring that back one. Okay, so the whites of the cones and how busy... How, they're really full in there. In yours? I mean, no, in yours. So that's just a small uh, intrusion into the bees' lives. Um, we're very fortunate to have some highly competent musicians here today. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, our friend Audra from Detroit area, who hasn't left home for quite a while. Audra Kubat. Audra, Audra Kubat. Am I far enough away without a mask? Uh, yes. I think so. Uh, Hi. How are you? I'm fine, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so good to see nice you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Richard. I've been like squeezing my own body as a show of love to all my friends. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to give a good squeeze to the crowd, Audra? Yes, I squeeze you. Mm. <laughs> We're all about socially distant affection lately. Yeah. yeah. And it especially works if you're a really good hugger, because then you're getting your head. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. You don't have to worry about too tight or too loose. So you don't, well, <laughs> you came up from Detroit. Give us a little short, uh, you're a musician and songwriter, mm -hmm. especially, especially love emotional songs I or do. you write out of your emotions a lot and I do. you do yeah. yeah I think um my part of my goal is to model vulnerability for everybody to give them to help encourage them to take that space that we forget to take a lot for ourselves and so I think it helps to to do it myself and then I often feel that people in the audience get to sort of experience that and you can see a lot of us need to have those like sort of moments where we can just let let the the guard go and let it all go emotive flows yeah so, um, um you uh have played music in the Detroit area for a long time haven't you mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Like how long? Huh? Um, about twenty something years. Uh, I think my first album was in 1999, but I was doing music a little bit before that. Um, and uh, for the last like ten years, I've been working in uh, Detroit public schools, bringing in uh, music experiences and songwriting, and helping teachers, uh, teaching pre-K teachers how to use music more in their daily practice. So 
doing all kinds of different things and I also teach like college songwriting. So I'm all over the place with that. And I'm working at a house uh, in Detroit right now, transforming it into a community space for the neighborhood in Northwest Goldberg. It's one of the hardest hit uh, areas in, within the city. And uh, yeah, so putting a lot of effort into this house with the idea that uh, we want to really raise a focus on that local community there, just like five or six blocks, those children there, those uh, children of all ages <laughs> to experience music. Audra, speaking of children, Easton, age three, asks, did a bee turn into that girl? <laughs> Are you a honeybee? Um, it's always possible. <laughs> you know, with imagination, we can, um, we can do all kinds of things, anything that your heart even, desires. Even fly. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, you mentioned you have a song uh, that has... Uh, Reference to bees in it, would you? Well, I, you know, I had a song that I was gonna play and I brought it in my pocket, um, but it's so new and I'm a little nervous about doing it. So then I thought, well, maybe I would do this other song about Mother Earth. Well, that is also a song that related, um, yeah. supports bees and all kinds of other creatures. Let's hear it. All creatures. Okay, so I'll do that one. It's called Oh Mother, and it's um, it's a celebration. Of this beautiful planet and also um, a reminder. Oh, mother of life, mother of day, we wait for the words that we promise to say. We stand in your shadow but must sit by your side to hear your song in the wind blowing wild. And I trust in the world you have given to us. I will fight with my bones and my fists if I must To shatter the walls they put up with fear I will break all the rules just to keep her here Oh, mother of mountains, mother of fire I climb your highest ridges and I light the pyre To burn down the kingdoms created by greed Dance on their ashes, watch their power recede. And I trust in the world you have given to us. I will fight with my heart and my mind if I must. To tear down the fences and take down the flags. We'll undraw the lines that divide us in half. Oh, mother of freedom, mother of hope. Back the blinders and I'll cut all the ropes. I'll smash all the windows, give away all my clothes. And I'll walk through your valleys, get your mud on my toes. Cause I trust in the world you have given to us. I will fight with my fingers to your nail if I must. And I'll study your body, whole space in your name. With all Mother of grace, well, please won't you tell me that it's not too late? Your bodies of water soon will run clear, and the men on the hill, they just don't seem to care. And I trust in the world you have given to us. I will fight with my songs and my words if I must. We'll gather the people, let's march to the drums, and we'll stand in the way.
has some music to bring in here. Wonderful. That was so wonderful. Thank you. It was very heartful and beautifully delivered. Thank you. I was so inspired hearing you um, talk about the bees and the way that you want to um, be thoughtful of their space and how important it is that we sort of consider all of these creatures around us as sentient and powerful and a part of like every, you know, every, um, like we are all a team together. It's like we're all on a baseball team. We need all parts to, to, to support and to work, to make it work. And uh, so beautifully the way that you, um, this whole experience of the bees and how to love them and, and treat them with kindness. So inspiring. Well, and young new beekeepers, how exciting too. So um, last week you. I read this little reading from, uh, I have to read it again because you just set it up so beautifully. Oh, okay. okay. We need a, another and a wiser and perhaps a more mystical concept of animals. Remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, man in his civilization surveys the creature through the glass of his knowledge and sees thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We patronize these creatures for their incompleteness for their tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves. And therein we err and greatly err, for the animal shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost, or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. Hmm. Perfect. Nice. Oh, Thanks for setting it up. Of course. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to um, hearing a few songs from Seth. Yeah. Are you ready, my friend? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Audra. Oh, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Bob, do you mind holding that up for the camera? Yeah, this is the new CD. And uh, Seth's going to share one of the songs, or two of these songs on here. And he wants me to play a tune that I've never heard before. <laughs> we'll see. Well, I'll tell a quick story while you uh, get your bow out. I started pretty young helping with the bees. And one time we went to attend uh, a field in Falmouth. Or no, it was out by Merritt, I think. And uh, it had just rained, so that you said the bees were cross. Yeah. And so I was wearing a veil that had a hole in it. I didn't realize there was a big hole in the veil right here. And I don't know, I was probably 11. And uh, a bunch of bees got in my veil. And so I started running, hitting myself in the face, and I could hear you behind me laughing. Oh, no. <laughs> I look back, and it's pretty funny, because where was I going to run to? The bees were in my veil. So I got stung a bunch of times on my face, and I, that helped me get over my fear of being stung, because it wasn't really all that bad. So now going to ask you to take a similar plunge and play a tune that you've never heard before in the key yeah, of D. Key, F sharp or something. <laughs> <laughs> it may or may not be in the same key that I tell you. No, it's in the key of D. It's a waltz. And I wrote this one for John Prine. Oh. It's called White Pine. Here we go. Great, and I'm going to be doing a little show over at the higher campfire tonight at 8 o'clock um, on my artist Facebook page if anyone wants to tune in it'll be very laid back <laughs> You 
you sprouted up from the earth so many years ago. So grateful your greatness we have come to know. And the years just flow by, rings upon rings. I'm here to sing of the solace you bring. What once was a seed has become a great tree. We sit in your shade, feeling happy and free. We've leaned on you through thick and thin. These are the times we have found our hearts With grace and with courage, we've weathered the season by night and by day. You've given us a reason to believe in each other, our families and friends, to believe in ourselves, to try again and again. We've laughed and we've cried in our times with you. You've helped us feel real by being so true, true to your nature with an eagle's view. And without your presence, I don't know what we'll do. What once was a seed has become a great tree. We sit in your shade, feeling happy and free. We've leaned on you through thick and thin. These are the times we have found our hearts in. Do we have time for a fiddle break here on BTV this morning? Oh, yeah. Take it away, Bob. songs that you made, they live with the wind. They keep our hearts strong for the times we live in. What once was a seed has become a great tree. We sit in your shade, feeling happy and free. We've leaned on you through thick and thin to grow our hearts strong for the times we live in. Guys, we've got about three minutes. I just wanted to give a shout out. Coming up next, we have a pre-recorded herb walk with Sierra Bigham. That's gonna be super awesome. Um, you filmed it right here on the property just a few days ago. We filmed it right here on the property just a few days ago, and there's a lot of good info in there. A little sweet golden well, hour walk. We've got time to sing the bee song then. We've got time for the B song. Right, let's get going on it. Any, you guys gonna sing with us? You got some words over there? Yep. So this song was written, and it just happens to be the co-author of it, um, is sitting here today, Donna Mottman. I used to do, All right, Donna. come to yeah. her classroom, and um, we did B projects for at least a couple of years, and one, and we entered a, a national contest to write a song about bees, and 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 we did, and we did very well in it. So, and we, we it was about bee biology. So, it starts in the fall instead of the spring because two minutes. Uh, yeah, it two made minutes. sense. It's called the cycle of the buzzing bee, the buzzing bees. Two one two minute, now, guys. Um, the Yankee Doodle. Oh, he's the yeah. The air is cold and 
nights are long, honeybees are quiet, clustered tight inside their hive with honey as their diet. Lady queen must bide her time, outside cold winds are blowing. She's warm inside the cluster now, there is no nectar flowing. April showers bring May flowers, bees are busy ladies. Hoarding nectar pollen too to feed their hungry babies. Queen is laying heavy now, she feeds on royal jelly. She fills 2,000 cells per day, the eggs come from her belly. The eggs are laid, the larva fed, the pupa are transforming. The hive is growing larger now, and soon they will be swarming. Jobs, cleaning, feeding, waxing, dancing, singing, flying, to be sure it must be taxing. Bees have reached full numbers now, warming winds to blow. The summer plants now in full bloom bring on a honey flow. Dancing, singing, honey, they tell the source of nectar sweet. Are gone, your days are surely faded.